Jola, please start. Good evening. Dobry wieczór. Witamy Państwa na dzisiejszym spektakl spektaklu. Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Jola Piesakowska Jackson. I'm a proud member of Ognisko Polskie and I'm your host tonight. You will all be muted. This event is being recorded and streamed live. If you don't want to be part of the recording, please switch off your video and you can also change your name if you wish. Uh, look at the list of participants, find yourself there, and you'll have the chance to change your name. Now, we usually have a very lively chat going on, and you can use the facility below to get involved in the discussions. Put your questions and your comments there in the chat, and we'll do our very best to get through them later on this evening. I would like to introduce the chairman of Ognisko Polskie, Dr. Jan Falkowski. Good evening. Welcome to Ognisko Pulse to our distinguished guests, members and friends. We've had some very successful virtual events and this is another one in our series of virtual events. We've celebrated some important dates in Polish history, including the regaining of its independence. COVID has been a very difficult period for everyone, particularly now we're in lockdown again. Fortunately, there's some light at the end of the tunnel as it appears the vaccines may, in due course, prove to help defeat COVID. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to an exciting and enjoyable event, which I'm sure we will all enjoy. It's my great pleasure to introduce His Excellency, the Ambassador, who would like to say a few words at the start of our event. Dear Chairman, um, distinguished panelists, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, drodzy przyjaciele, it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all at the Ognisko webinar at the next Ognisko meeting. This time, our discussion is dis devoted to a very special topic, art, craft and architecture. One of the most interesting period in Polish, but also in European and world uh, history of culture. Today, we will talk on Młoda Polska, on Young Poland. The reason why we meet today is wonderful book, album, Young Poland, the Polish Arts and Crafts Movement, 1890-1918. I'd like to congratulate uh, William Morris Gallery, National Museum in Krakow, Polish Cultural Institute in London, and all people who are involved in this amazing pro project. I would like to congratulate um, authors, and I'm so glad that authors are with us, especially Julia Griffin and Professor Andrzej Szczerski. So let's enjoy this amazing and very interesting evening. Thank you. And on behalf of Ognisko Polskie, I would like to thank His Excellency Professor Arkady Zagotsky, Ambassador to the Republic of Poland, for his kind words and his support for this event. June is singed in my memory as a month of school exams. Sitting for what seemed like hours and hours in heavy silence on a hot summer's day, the sun beating through the windows and writing and writing and writing. Outside, the grass and trees are still as a painting. Pittsford was a small boarding school, and from the age of seven, every pupil suffered in silence as the big girls sat in the hall doing O or A levels. But art A level was a liberation. The big girls painted their exam piece over a few days, giving their watercolors, tempera and gouache time to dry and us small girls could snoop around and see their paintings progress. My sister is four years older than me. Her class were into Cat Stevens, The Incredible String Band, Wishbone Ash, oh, and Mark Bolan, who we all muttered was like us, an invisible pole. In the 1970s, 
Girl's A-level painting style was influenced by posters from Athena and of course, William Morris stained glass, ladies and gentlemen with mysterious hair and eyes. But we were different. We were invisible poles born in England and somehow in Pittsford near Northampton, we had our own secret influence. We had our own Polish arts and crafts artist. We had Wispiański. When those six formers lined up their A-level exam paintings before sending them off, us young girls gathered around to admire them. My sister's painting was the best, a dreamscape of fluid lines drawn in black rotring pen and watercolors as rich as the stained glass in Basilica Świętego Franciszka, Kraków. And of course, she passed with an A. And so I'm particularly happy to welcome tonight our Polish secret. So I'd like to introduce to you tonight our Polish secret, the Polish arts and crafts movement. And tonight, the book launch of Young Poland, the Polish arts and crafts movement, 1890 to 1918. Tonight, we will explore and celebrate Wyspiański and the artists and craftspeople of the Młoda Polska movement. I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished panel, academic editors, Julia Griffin, William Morris Gallery, Professor Andrzej Szczerski, Director of the National Museum in Kraków. And they're here tonight with co-author Rasheen Inglesby, Senior Cur Curator at the William Morris Gallery. Thank you very much, Sheila. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for inviting us. It's a great pleasure. Thanks. Thank you very much. Lovely. Young Poland is considered by many the greatest period in Polish art history. The Young Poland movement is almost unknown here in Britain. Yet the parallels with the British arts, craft and design are unmissable. The display in William Morris Gallery will be the first chance for British public to see often unknown names, unknown beauty, and in the same time will be able to show the British public its reflection in Polish mirror. At the William Morris Gallery, we're really interested not just in Morris's own work, but also in thinking how Morris influenced uh, and was similar to movements of arts and crafts that were happening all across Europe at a similar time. So we're very interested in bringing those ideas um, to the William Morris Gallery and sharing them with audiences um, to discover the similarities, but also the differences between Morris's work and the work of international arts and crafts movements. At the Polish Cultural Institute, we're dedicated to bringing Polish arts and culture closer to the British audiences, making this project such a beautiful experience and true opportunity for us. In our ongoing partnership with the William Morris Gallery team, we had a pleasure to establish connections with key museums and art collections in Poland, opening doors and helping to bring curators, founding and scholars together. The National Museum in Kraków has the largest and the finest collection of young Poland art and this exhibition will bring for the first time such exuberant display of our masterpieces to London. The Young Poland Arts and Crafts Movement began in 1890. Poland did not exist as a state throughout the 19th century. In fact, as a result of unprecedented political catastrophe, it ceased to exist as a result of foreign invasion by the three neighbouring powers, Russia, Austria and Germany. The country only regained independence at the end of World War I after 123 years of oppression. People understood that culture would be the only way of preserving the nation's identity and um, that's how the Young Poland movement started, resulting in an unprecedented flourishing of all the arts, 
painting, sculpture, as well as the decorative arts and the revival of crafts. The movement drew inspiration from history, nature, as well as the peasant material culture. The Polish territory was subdivided between three oppressive powers, of which Russia and Prussia were the strictest. Uh, on the other hand, the Austrian authorities were more liberal, affording the Polish people uh, a moderate level of freedom, uh, allowing a progressive patriotic movement like Young Poland to, to take shape. The movement in fact started in the historic city of Kraków and the nearby village of Zakopane in the wild Tatra mountains um, where people had even more freedom. One particular um, source of inspiration was the material culture of the Highlanders who were the indigenous population of the Tatra mountains and the village of Zakopane. They had long-term craft traditions of vernacular architecture, wooden carving, embroidery. Uh, their methods and their ornamentation um, inspired the young Poland artists a great deal. The Zakopane style is a form of decorative arts and material culture based on the visual culture of the Tatra Mountains. The Zakopane style was founded by Stanislav Witkiewicz. We don't know the exact relationship between Morris and Witkiewicz's work, but we do know that there is a huge amount of parallel between the two movements and the visual manifestations of their ideas. Stanislav Witkiewicz actually sent photographs of his work to John Ruskin, who is one of Morris's mentors and one of the founding influences of the arts and crafts movement in England. Ruskin was apparently very impressed by Witkiewicz's work, although unfortunately was too old to go and visit. Stanisław Wyspiański was arguably William Morris's counterpart uh, on so many levels, uh, not least in terms of both men's incredible versatility as interior decorators. Uh, Wyspiański de designed church, civic and domestic decorative schemes just like Morris did. Like Morris, Wyspiański was a polymath. He was able to produce work in a variety of different media, such as stained glass, textiles. Uh, he did the interior design of domestic and churches, uh, and he worked across a variety of different media. Like Morris, he believed that it was important that an artist should be able to cut across all sorts of media in order to create the perfect interior. Two of the lesser known artists we're particularly proud to present are Karol Kosowski from Zakopane, who created the Silent Villa, a total work of art, um, a fairy tale house, handicrafted by himself. Uh, he had a Mauritian genius for ornament and was a real polymath, not unlike Morris in terms of the wide scope of crafts that he experimented with. Another unsung heroine of, of the movement um, was the remarkable poet Maria Pavlikowska Jasnozewska, who was also a very talented artist. She created a remarkable body of watercolors featuring uh, fantastical and macabre uh, elements uh, partially inspired by the peasant material culture. Young Poland, the Polish arts and crafts movement, is an international project which comprises three elements. One of them is uh, the world's first book uh, on, on Young Poland seen from the arts and crafts perspective in any language. The exhibition under the same title will open at the William Morris Gallery and there's also a project website aimed at popularizing the movement. The exhibition will bring to London for the first time such exuberant display of masterpieces of Polish arts and crafts of that period and also we'll look at the parallels between Polish and British cultures, often unexpected.
These peculiar contacts, which are often forgotten or underestimated, has been my academic interest for many years, and I am extremely proud to be able to show the results of this work now in London, thanks to the cooperation with numerous curators and other colleagues who contributed both to the exhibition and to the book. This is the most rewarding curatorial project I've ever worked on, with the best people, the best organizations, colleagues from the William Morris Gallery and colleagues from the National Museum in Kraków, Poland's oldest museum. The project brings together my Polish roots with my British home and my British husband and uh, it's particularly rewarding being able to illuminate the creative vision of these extraordinary artists on an international arena and to share their art with my British friends. Ladies and gentlemen, Roisin Inglesby will now share a PowerPoint and uh, our discussion will begin. Hey, thank you so much, Sheila. So yes, I am going to share the PowerPoint now. So I'm hoping you can all see this. Um, Yola, could you just give me a thumbs up if that's appearing on your screen? Excellent, that's, that's the first hurdle down. Okay, brilliant. So thank you so much for joining us, everybody. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as the one of the few uh, non-native Polish speakers uh, on the panel tonight, I'm uh, I'm very very grateful to be allowed allowed to be here. And do forgive me uh, in advance if I massacre any of these complicated words. I have been practicing. I do promise. Um, so this evening uh, we are going to talk you through Young Poland in ten objects. Uh, Andrzej, Julia and myself are curators and uh, there will be an exhibition at the William Morris Gallery next year um, and so we think through objects so that's how we've decided to uh, to rationalize what we're what we're going to talk about today so it'll be 10 objects that uh, are instrumental in our understanding of young Poland. We are also here though to celebrate uh, a particular object that is very close to our hearts at the moment, um, which is the book Young Poland that is out very, very soon. Um, and even though we are object people, we obviously understand that objects are nothing without the people who make and use them. And uh, for that, we are incredibly grateful to Lund Humphreys, who are the publishers of our book, uh, in particular to Lucy Clark, uh, Lucy Myers, Abigail Grater and Anna Norman, uh, without whom this book could definitely not have, have come into existence. So thank you very much. So moving from the heroes of our particular story uh, to the wider heroes of the Mladopolska movement, uh, I just wanted to show you this uh, slide here, just so you have a sense and you can put some faces to some of the names that we're going to be talking about later. Uh, I mean, we're not going to go through everybody because there are, there are like there have been too many people to thank uh, for the production of the book. Uh, there are also too many people to go through uh, for the Mladopolska movement, but here are some of the faces uh, and some of the producers of the object that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to move on to the first object now and I think Julia is going to start the introduction of this one. Uh, hello, good evening ladies and gent gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here tonight with my uh, co-editor Professor Andrzej Szczerski and my colleague uh, Roshin Inglesby. Um, and to have the chance to, um, to share with you our passion for, for the Young Poland period. Um, this particular image uh, is arguably the key to unlocking Young Poland art and uh, is also the key to explaining the main concept behind our book. Um, <clears throat> on the left, um, the personification of art points the artist depicted as a nude youth towards the only worthwhile subject matter, nature and the simple idealized life of the country dweller. 
I will come back to the symbolism of this image in a minute. Firstly, let me say a few words about the approach um, we have adopted in our book. Uh, just a few words about the present status quo. Uh, over the past century, young Poland has been viewed almost exclusively in the context of European Art Nouveau. This does not allow for a more nuanced understanding of the complexity and the underlying values of the movement. It is also contrary to how many young Poland makers viewed their own practice, openly disassociating themselves from Art Nouveau, seeking a more original and a more native mode of expression. Stanisław Wyspiański and Karol Kłosowski were just two examples who um, openly disassociated themselves from Art Nouveau. So we very much hope that our book um, may change the existing paradigm, arguing that young Poland displayed more fundamental parallels with the international arts and crafts movement, which started in Britain in the 1880s and spread across Europe and America over the next three decades, right up to World War I. Um, our book also adopts the fundamental distinction between arts and crafts and Art Nouveau with respect to, to, with respect to the nature of the work produced and also um, their respective attitudes to means of production and specifically the value of handiwork. This distinction was first introduced um, by the Morris scholar, Linda Parry. Although the two movements are often confused, in fact, they could not be more different. In simplest terms, Art Nouveau was a style. It was concerned mainly with the appearance of things and it followed the doctrine of art for art's sake. On the other hand, Arts and Crafts was an ideology, striving to change the world. It was a set of moral and social values concerning life and work and following the doctrine of art and beauty for all rather than art for art's sake. Art Nouveau was cosmopolitan, pleasure-seeking, sensual and luxurious, characterized by sumptuous materials and elaborate applied surface decoration, such as verniers and marquetry on furniture, enameling in jewelry, or brocading on silks. It frequently relied on mechanized methods of production, disregarding the value of handiwork. On the other hand, arts and crafts was about simplicity, honesty of materials, championing the central role of handiwork and the value of the creative process, not just the end product. These distinctions are not so simple in the case of young Poland artists who simultaneously aspired to develop their own autonomous means of, means of expression whilst having to uh, respond to progressive artistic trends within Western Europe in order for young Poland to be taken seriously as a cultural force in the international arena. Um, as John Kavanagh convincingly demonstrated, it is true that young Poland combined many competing and frequently blending strands of which Art Nouveau was just one. Nevertheless, young Poland's parallels with the arts and crafts movement are the mo most fundamental and most paramount. So let's go back uh, to the imagery of Mehofer's Nature and Art. Nature and Art conveys this, um, this quintessence of the new arts of young Poland. Crucially, it also captures this apparently incongruous duality between the movement's underlying ethos and its recurrent superficial stylistic manifestation. The personification of art dressed in a sumptuous gown resembling a vestment points the artist 
towards the only worthwhile preoccupations, celebration of nature and the ideal simple life of the country dweller. The refined high priestess of art is depicted in an overtly art nouveau style. She is in stark contrast with the peasant girl and the archetypal Polish landscape, complete with mountains right in the center, which evoke the simplicity and beauty of the new sources of the art revival shared with the British arts and crafts artists. This powerful image shows that the arts and crafts ethos lay at the core of young Poland's yearning for regaining independence, despite the movement's known recourse to Art Nouveau. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me also share my thanks with you for being invited to this uh, wonderful event and also express my gratitude to all my colleagues in UK for having produced this excellent book, which I hope all of you will enjoy together with the exhibition next year in, in William Morris Gallery. As Julia already mentioned, uh, this image is not only quintessential about its message regarding Art Nouveau versus Art and Craft, but also conveys some uh, hints at what is Polish about it. And I think this is a key also to understand the vitality and importance of uh, this period in Polish art history, because on the one hand, it is extremely focused on the national issues. And in the same time, it's trying to speak the international language and to convey this message in a language that would be understood uh, worldwide. So there's this, uh, uh, very productive tension between national and international uh, in art of young Poland. Julia has already described you what's international about it. Let me uh, just mention how Mehofer nicely um, involves here references to the Polish countryside. Not only the mountains, which we will refer to later on as well, the symbol of the stability, durability, and also uh, enclosure. Uh, a culture that lives on its own in the mountain range as a source of Polishness. On the right hand side, you see a typical Polish village, um, something that is also a residue of new forms and new vitality, because the folk art and the folk culture will be the source of revival as understood by the artist then. You also see the peasant girl. She is dressed in a sort of simplified version of the uh, folk costume from the area of Kraków, uh, red waistcoat and the skirt uh, refers to the characteristic dress of the peasants of the, uh, of the area, which also a source of inspiration. She's holding the sunflowers in her hand. They became a very potent symbol in young Poland period because they were standing for transformation uh, because uh, they produced the seeds, they look like sun and, and uh, they stood for, for revival, for renewal. And also you see storks above. Uh, storks are also a very potent symbol in Polish folk culture because they represent the return of life after winter. They tend to go for winter time in the uh, south part of uh, Europe or to Africa and then return in the spring. They always stood for a renewal of life. And this is exactly, and they, all tend to, they also uh, you know, believe to bring babies with them. So uh, they are also a symbol of revival. This is what, what, what the Polska stood for. And also this very notion, young Poland, refers to renewal. And uh, it's very important to understand this uh, precisely around 1900, this idea of national revival coincided with the revival of art. Um, let me end with a note on the personalities behind all those work. Uh, Roisin has shown us uh, the images of artists. But let me also mention that this work that we have accomplished wouldn't be possible without uh, previous work of many scholars who started to break this barrier with Poland and UK uh, in terms of research of, of Polish uh, young Poland. And uh, some of them are in the audience tonight. So I'd like to mention the name and thank them for their contribution to the understanding of, of Art Nouveau and young Poland. 
namely uh, Professor Jeremy Howard from University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and Professor David Crowley, formerly in RCA in London, now in National College of Art and Design in Dublin. And also let me mention um, a remarkable lady who was also very instrumental in bringing together Polish and British scholars already in the early 2000s, Professor Nicola Gordon Bove from National College of Art and Design in Dublin, uh, who passed away in 2019, sadly. Uh, but her work was extremely influential also in my understanding of arts and crafts, and I'd like to pay tribute to her uh, tonight. Thank you very much. We decided to go through uh, altogether 10 objects uh, this evening. Uh, each of us will present you uh, our own selection of those objects. And uh, uh, the first one is uh, precisely uh, the stained glass window designed by Henrik Ujembo, who was a major arts and crafts artist in young Poland uh, period. Uh, this window is actually executed and is presented in one of the houses in central Krakow. Let me first explain shortly its iconography. What you see here is quintessentially Polish landscape with the empty fields, the weeping willow. And at the very end, uh, what you see this architectural monument is the Babel uh, Castle and Cathedral in Krakow, the former seat of Polish kings. Uh, which became a, a symbol of uh, Polish national identity uh, in 19th century during period of partition. It was, as Wyspiański would call it, Polish Acropolis, the holy hill where the memory of former Poland was preserved. And now with the Ujembo stained glass, you see that uh, the symbol is being uh, connected with the revival, uh, associated with the revival of the nature itself, because it's, uh, it's spring. It's the moment where life returns. It's a moment when you have once again high hopes for, uh, for new uh, cultural and national revival. Um, the symbolism of spring was very much used around Europe at that period. Um, and uh, all the artists who were traveling for innovative language, they referred to the idea of, uh, of this season of the year. Um, but in this particular image, the context is also the revival of this very monument at the back, because the Babel Castle, once Poland was divided between these three powers, Krakow uh, became Austrian garrison city, and there were soldiers uh, living, uh, made with the barracks placed in the Babel Castle, and uh, the whole hill was secluded from the town. Only at around 1905, the castle started to be restored because Poles bought it back from the Austrian army. And uh, officially it was supposed to be the residence of the Austrian emperor, but in fact, it was a way to, uh, to have it uh, restored. So in a way, it's not only the nature that is being revived here and brings back, uh, brought back to life, but it's also this very monument that stood for the revival of not, not just the building, but also of course of Polish uh, national traditions. And last point here, uh, this is a stained glass window. It was a technique very much developed in the arts and crafts period around Europe, especially in Britain. And Polish artists were also very keen to, uh, to design stained glasses and they really proliferated, especially in Krakow, also other cities in Poland. Uh, there was a particular company which produced them in Krakow, the Zeleński factory. They were made by hand, so they very much referred to the arts and crafts idea of uh, handicraft. So here you have uh, all these three important trends in arts and crafts all together. So the symbolism, the technique, handicraft, and this national international message. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, so I will now move on to, to discuss our, our second object, um, pansies 
by uh, Stanislaw Vespiansky, um, the, um, the image we have chosen for, for the cover of our book. Um, Vespiansky was, uh, was an incredible polymath and today I will focus on his natural ability um, as a floral patterns designer uh, as just one per particular perspective uh, onto his prolific output. Uh, firstly, I will just uh, share with you a couple of quotations from Vespiansky himself about his approach to nature and the role of nature in his applied arts practice. In 1896, he, um, he wrote um, to one of his friends, uh, I am so pleased that I don't need to go to any trouble. All I need is to pick up a plant, examine and consider it, and to understand how it grows, and once I have understood its distinctive style, I can then take another look and easily be begin to arrange it into a design. Um, in another letter, Vispiansky, um, Vis Vispiansky described his daily preoccupation, of, preoccupation with plants. I had been going to the banks of the Vistula River to the meadows to get flowers, which I then stylize and immediately conceive designs for lamps, candlesticks, columns, pillars, borders, friezes, walls. I want to live and breathe this entire glistening and mysterious world of nature. What miracles it holds. Uh, Vespiansky, um, I, well, one could say that it was Vespiansky's mother who instilled a love of wayside indigenous plants in her son. Vespiansky's mother used to decorate his father's sculpture workshop uh, with, um, with plants from the meadows around Kraków. <clears throat> This repeating floral pattern um, is a wall painting at the medieval Franciscan church in Kraków. It is part of Vespiansky's complex iconographic scheme uh, comprising ornamental, floral and figurative wall paintings, as well as stained glass, comprising a total work of art of great beauty. Uh, we have several chapters on Vespiansky in our book. Um, there is a dedicated chapter on, on the iconography um, of the Franciscan Church by Magdalena um, Laskowska. Uh, there is another chapter about um, Vespiansky and Wawel, um, including a really interesting discussion of his preoccupation with, um, with flowers. And there's also another chapter which um, about the similarities between um, Vespiansky and Morris. So we, we do encourage you to, um, to have a look at the book. Uh, Vespiansky designed, supervised and partially carried out the whole scheme um, at the Franciscan church whilst still in his twenties. Um, he was working in the spirit of a master craftsman working alongside a team of artisans. The medieval Franciscan church got damaged in the Great Fire of Krakow in 1850, uh, which resulted in a design competition for a new decorative scheme uh, announced by the Franciscans in 1894. The iconography was inspired by the 14th century Little Flowers of St. Francis um, and also Francis's Canticle of the Sun. Vespiansky was in fact the first Polish artist to make flowers an important theme in his art. His designs are characterized by simplicity and modernity. He um, endeavored to convey the unique character of each plant avoiding excessive stylization and avoiding any 
historicizing styles, um, resulting in incredible modernity and simplicity. Thank you. Over to my colleagues. Um, I think the next slide is something that I would really like to bring up. Um, so I believe if we look at the next slide, there will be some comparisons. Yeah, the one, that one, perfect. There'll be some comparisons between Vispiansky's work and William Morris's work. So the reason, or one of the reasons that the exhibition is happening at the William Morris Gallery is because there are some fantastic parallels, but also some significant differences between the British arts and crafts movement, which happened in, in Britain uh, towards the kind of mid to late 19th century uh, and the Young Poland movement, which was a little bit later. Uh, but something that really comes out, I think, when you compare uh, images um, from the key artists in the Young Poland movement and Morris and the work of Morris and his collaborators is the, the shared love of the natural world, of course, the idea of art and nature being kind of indivisible and that one feeds the other um, in, a, in sort of an endless circle of life and regeneration. And when you look at these designs here. So we have these two designs on the right um, by William Morris and his colleague Philip Webb. Uh, these, this was the first wallpaper ever designed by William Morris. Uh, so it's quite experimental. You can see it's quite simple in comparison with some of his later work, uh, but it has this very strong geometric grid structure. Uh, and then it has nature um, as an intrinsic part of the, of the design. You know, the nature is what structures the art essentially. Uh, Philip Webb was a collaborator of William Morris. He drew in the birds and Morris did the, the trellis, the floral, floral design. So it's also a collaborative design. And that is something that is extremely important in both the British arts and crafts movement and also in young Poland. So um, I can certainly see some visual similarities between these two, um, even though they were created uh, in different countries and at different times. Uh, but I think the spirit and the movement uh, essentially of these designs is really quite comparable. Our next object is this uh, um, wonderful piece of architectural modeling. It's a model of a villa, a house uh, built in Zakopane, the village that has already, already been mentioned, high in Tatra mountain, south of Krakow, about 100 kilometers south of Krakow. So we are now moving from Krakow, which is basically the capital of, of young Poland in terms of the uh, vitality of art scene there and the amount of masterpieces produced in the city southward. And uh, this has been um, a city, well, a, a small village which became a, a fashionable spa uh, among uh, Polish middle class and aristocracy around 1900, but it was also a very uh, important center for uh, regional life and especially the local uh, Highlander uh, folk culture, which was very elaborate in terms of. Uh, it's ornamentation, but also music, uh, uh, wood carving, uh, wooden constructions, etc. And those who came there from 1880s onwards uh, were absolutely enchanted by its vitality and quality. But it was only in the 1890s that someone called Stanislav Witkiewicz, an artist, painter, and art critic from Warsaw, came down there because of his lung problems and uh, basically. To, uh, to cure himself. And he settled there and became uh, completely enchanted with the, with the local uh, culture and decided that this has to be a source of uh, revival of Polish art and architecture. Because he saw that Highlanders culture, they are in Polish known as Gurale, is the basically unspoiled residue of national motifs. And they only have to be upgraded or stylized by the professional artists with the help of Highlanders themselves to become a fully developed style that would speak about Polish national identity and cultural uniqueness. So there are different manifestations of the style that he envisaged, but the most important was the construction of buildings and the interiors. And he found very sympathetic patrons in Zakopane, also other members of the Polish elite who settled down there for 
different reason, uh, not, not just because of it was a, uh, was a spa, but also it was the, uh, a center of the Polish, um, we would say together, ecological thought. So this particular family, Pawlikowski family, who paid for this house, this was their family house in Zakopane, they were among the pioneers of the protection of nature. They founded the National Park in Tatra Mountain. And as you will see in a few minutes, they also produced a range of artists uh, among themselves living in this particular house. So it was also, a, a, we would say, a, an artistic center on, on itself. This is the interior of the house. We will come back to it in a minute. First of all, let me show you the, uh, the, uh, the object itself. This model was produced for 1900 Universal Exhibition in Paris. Um, Kraków and Zakopane being part of Austria were part of the Austrian presentation in Paris, but Austrians gave their different regions where different nations lived a certain autonomy so they could present their local national culture. So this is how Witkiewicz was able to pro produce this this model and show it in Paris as a symbol of Polishness. What you see here is the basically um, elaboration on the model of the uh, wooden uh, cottage of Highlanders, that it's uh, almost tripled in size, as the uh, two floors has very uh, extravagant ornamentation, and it's all made of wood. So he shows that the, the peasant basically but a low culture can be elaborated to serve as a model of the fully developed style that will satisfy the needs of the modern society. In the same time, he used only the construction uh, typical for the region. And this house was built by Highlander craftsmen and builders because he believed that they have this inborn natural capacity to produce the, the style themselves. So on the one hand, it's a very sophisticated uh, project. In the same time, it's executed according to the local uh, principles and the local, for instance, love of the material and its, uh, and its application. The wood here is the, the key and this poetry of wood is what, uh, what brings uh, to life this uh, uh, unusual house. The house actually stands right by the mountains. It's, it's almost um, that you can almost touch the mountain from, from its windows and it's beautifully located around the firs, this particular tree. That's why its name is House Under the Firs. If we look at the interior though, this is uh, absolutely stunning uh, quality of the interior design. This object uh, is about uh, two meters high altogether with splints, but this is the actual house as it looks with the uh, arts and craft principles in creating a complete work of art where all the different artistic crafts are combined to create the unity and the feeling of homely. Uh, atmosphere. Uh, all these objects were designed by Witkiewicz and the Highlanders, plus um, artists who came to Zakopane to follow Witkiewicz's idea of the style. It was ultimately known as Zakopane style after the name of the village. Um, just to give you one example, uh, the curtains you see, they have particular ornamentation on them. And this is exactly based on the local ornamentation that Witkiewicz elaborated, local ornamentation found on the uh, for instance, clothes of, of the Highlanders. He's also using um, uh, various uh, objects uh, known in the Gurale household and is upgrading them so they become armchairs, for instance, or um, sofas. On the right hand side, uh, you see uh, a dining room. On the left, it's a drawing room, a salon. Uh, they are joined together and uh, in London, we will show in the exhibition with the Moritz Gallery, we will show some of the chairs in Zakopane style and ceramics, which you see in the far, uh, on the far right in the background. Um, so you will get the taste of the interior. The book shows more, uh, it shows these images. This house uh, is probably the greatest house that Witkiewicz ever designed and shows this, uh, the quality of uh, um, the Zakopane style as an idea. In the same time, let me mention that uh, this house was also a manifestation, not only of Polish national identity and its uniqueness, uh, because he pretty much believed that if a nation has its own style, it means it's culturally different from the others, and as such has a right to live independently. So there's a political message behind this interior. But there's also a very important social message here. He talks about national solidarity. 
because she's using the patterns produced by the folk people to uh, enliven them and to make them capable of satisfying the needs of upper classes of the society. In Polish realities around 1900, the gap between folk people, the country people and the city people aristocracy was enormous. And this was seen also as an obstacle for national revival because these two uh, social groups lived side by side. In order to make the country being revived or independent, you had to make them work together. So this message of the social cohesion, we would say, or uh, the correspondence between different classes of the society here is very much explained. Mm, and as such, it's also a very important message of, uh, of Witkiewicz, because he truly believed in the national community as a community of equal people, regardless of their social background. And through art, he was looking as, uh, for this reconciliation uh, between them. So therefore, this, uh, uh, this style had this uh, very complex message of being both uh, national and social in, in its content. Uh, and on top of that, as I mentioned, this very house became also the seat of uh, the very important family, Pavlikovsky family who produced artists, uh, ecological thinkers. Um, uh, and we will talk about one of those uh, personalities who lived in this house and created their works there very, very soon. Uh, this house is in, still in private hands and it luckily survived the communism period when places like that were all, uh, often very much ruined or robbed or ravaged. Uh, in the same time, you can see it from the outside. Uh, and um, it also still is quality because it be belongs in still in private family. And it shows that this concept from over 100 years ago is still very much um, a, a model of a house that I guess most of us would like to live in. Thank you. Right, so the next object takes us back to Krakow. Um, this is an object to introduce the Krakow workshops, uh, which was a cooperative collaboration. Um, it was an organization of artists, artisans, designers, and professionals in the art industry. It was centered in Krakow um, between 1913 and 1926, so it had a relatively short lifespan, um, but within those 13 years, the participants at the Krakow workshop really introduced a new kind of design uh, to Poland and actually to the world. Um, in 1925, they exhibited at the Exposition of uh, Decorative Arts in Paris, uh, which became known as the Art Deco Exhibition. It was the exhibition that really put Art Deco uh, as a style in the international arena uh, and the Krakow workshops actually contributed a huge amount and won a lot of awards and medals um, at that exposition. So I think that's a really good example of how influential this uh, group of people operating in the city of Krakow was. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, Poland was split between three uh, powers uh, during this time. Uh, but the city of Krakow, being in the uh, Austro-Hungarian part of the partition, was one of the most um, sort of liberated of the three. And they had a lot of links with the city of Vienna, which was also a real design centre at that time. So the Krakow workshops are comparable um, to other organizations of craftspeople, designers and artists that were happening across Europe at that time, uh, notably the Wiener Werkstatt in Vienna. And also actually, I think um, they can be seen as prefiguring the Bauhaus um, to some extent, which was established, it was a school of art and design established in Germany in 1919. And the reasons for these similarities is that the workshops were very keen to um, explore the possibilities of technology uh, and the role of craft within technology. So kind of the traditional view of the arts and crafts movement is that it is um, not fundamentally against technology, but is, is rather sort of uh, backward thinking, one might say, or rather a traditionalist thinking and the primacy of handwork and craft work uh, always um, takes over um, the possibilities of the machine. However, in the crack of workshops, there was also an understanding of the need to modernize and need to create a new type of design to be appropriate to the 20th century. Uh, and the desire to really place artisanal skill and artisanal understanding 
branding and handwork and craft work within the new context of, of technology and machinery and think about how these two things could coexist. So it was a kind of a synthesizing of design between traditional and modern. And I think this batik silk scarf um, is a really good way of, of explaining this and exploring some of these ideas. So you can see that there is an element of the traditional folk um, craft and folk design um, that Andre was just talking about. You know, there is definitely, it has a sort of a folky element to it. And you see these sort of quite cute abstracted horses. You know, there's a definitely, you know, an echo of the countryside in this design. But there are also these kind of very abstracted geometric uh, ideas, you know, the horses, they're not kind of cutesy horses, they're abstracted ones. You also have these, the shapes, you know, the, the, the triangles and the square shapes. Um, and this adds an element of modernity, an element of kind of um, liberation from some of the more um, folksy aspects of design, I think. And at the Crack of Workshops, they were very keen not to fetishize the, the traditional crafts of Poland. You know, they, they took them on board and they fundamentally respected the spirit of them, but they weren't trying to recreate them. They weren't trying to collect um, elements of folk art and they were very keen to try and do something new. So what they took from traditional art was this idea that there was a kind of intrinsic rhythm, an intrinsic um, power, if you like, this kind of um, behind the scenes, behind everything, there was an element of artistic intuition and inspiration that kind of traveled through the ages. And, and the word that was used was a rhythm, a kind of a rhythm of folk art, a rhythm of design that could be transmitted if you knew how to, how to listen or how to read traditional folk objects. And I think actually in this design, one of the reasons I like it so much is because you can, it looks almost to me like musical notation, you know, it looks like a musical score, you can almost feel the sense of rhythm beating, you can imagine these horses kind of marching through this fabric. And I think there's this real, real sense um, of the movement and of this desire to kind of take the power of artisanal craft of, of folk design, and then transform it into something fitting for the modern world. So I, I, I truly love this object. I think it's fantastic. Um, it's a batik uh, silk scarf. Um, and the owner, uh, sorry, the creator, uh, Akovovitz, um, he was a, a dye actually. He was in, in charge of the dye works um, at the Krakow workshops for a while. Um, and he won an, uh, an award at the 1925 Art Deco exhibition. But this was in 1913. So this is an early and quite experimental piece. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Thank you. Um, this is another batik. So this is also a work of the Krakow workshops. And I mentioned uh, the, it, they're both batik. Um, batik, uh, I'm sure many of you know, but batik is a, um, it's a technique of wax resist dyeing. It actually originates in the Indonesian island of Java. Uh, it's a traditional craft form in Indonesia. And um, it was brought to the attention of Europeans um, in the late 19th century um, because the Dutch who were you know, colonial powers in East Asia, uh, they brought examples of Javanese batik back to Europe and it was exhibited um, at various ex uh, international exhibitions and world fairs. And it really kind of took off, but people were really, really interested in batik. Something that I learned though through the course of this research for this, uh, the chapter in this book though, is that also um, batik type uh, craft was also used in Poland traditionally. So uh, it was not done on fabric, but it was done on eggs uh, and this idea of resist dyeing. So basically, um, you know, you have a material, whether it is fabric, whether it's wood, whether it's an egg, and you, um, you use wax uh, to protect elements of it. And then when you dye it, of course, you the wax you know, doesn't absorb the dye. And so you can create your patterns this way. So it was it was a skill um, that was cultivated and it was really used a lot and actually the batik artists and the batik workshop were one of the or in fact maybe the most successful um, aspect of the Krakow workshop so there were many um, studios you know there was furniture um, there was textiles you know there was metalwork there was all kinds of things but the batik studio was one of the most commercially successful and one of the most long-lasting 
And what made the studio especially interesting was that the people who worked in there were not traditionally trained as artists. So the silk scarf that you see on the left here was by someone called Zofia Kogut. And she and her two sisters were three of the girls um, or young women who were trained uh, in Batik uh, at the Krakow workshops. The, there was a couple of um, educators, I suppose, at the workshops who were particularly interested um, in teaching and in, in how, how you could make uh, great art and how you could make people into great artists and designers. And they were very uh, interested in the idea of intuition and the idea of imagination uh, as opposed to a strictly formal training. And this was not unique to Poland, um, even in France at that time where, where some of these educators had actually been and they'd seen these examples uh, in France, uh, for example, in the studio of Paul Poiret, the fashion designer. This idea that you could take kind of essentially uneducated young people, often women, uh, and show them things, you know, take them to the botanical gardens, take them to the zoo, show them, show them art, show them culture, show them design, and then use them, well, ask them through that knowledge to then create things according to their own imagination. So this was how the Batik artists uh, were supposed to work at the Krakow workshops. Uh, and uh, Sophia Kogut and her two sisters, um, one of them wrote a, a sort of little diary about how this worked. And they would have, a, they wouldn't be allowed to draw with pencil. They wouldn't sketch a design with pencil in advance. They would just have a, a sort of a stylus filled with wax, uh, warm wax. And they had to, of course, work Work really quickly to get their shapes down uh, on the fabric because the wax would go hard so they had to work very very quickly so it was this kind of intuitive method um, that was based on sort of uh, channeling inspiration channeling beauty and channeling nature uh, and through a kind of a, a non-educated uh, way of designing uh, but the effects are absolutely beautiful um, and you can see you know very clearly in the design on the on the left, uh, the sort of the natural forms, the abstracted shapes of the birds and the flowers, um, and you know there is it's not symmetrical, but there's a real rhythm, there's a real movement, uh, and a real cohesion. I think to this design. Next, please. Uh, hello again. Um, we are delighted to be able to introduce to you um, Karol Kłosowski, um, who was um, arguably the last young Poland artist. He died in 1871 and um, a Mauritian genius for ornament. Our book presents Kłosowski as one of the most original painters, designers, and master craftsmen of the young Poland period. A half orphan from a poor peasant family with no prospect for a higher education, Kłosowski was a child prodigy and his talent won him a series of scholarships to study at the best vocational craft schools and art academies um, in Galicia and abroad, uh, he studied at the vocational crafts, uh, he studied at the Wood Industry Vocational School, um, the School of Decorative Arts in Krakow, the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and the Academy of Fine Arts in Krakow. Um, after his studies, he decided to settle down in the village of Zakopane and he was actively involved in the foundation of the Pothale Art Society and the Kilim Association. As a child um, growing up in, in a peasant family, he pursued many forms of folk art, including the humble paper cutting used for decorating peasant cottages. Uh, his art is characterized by an incredible integration of um, um, by an integral integrate by an uh, by a central integration of all arts and by cultural democracy and a joy of making even at moments um, of great adversity. For the sake of today's presentation, let's look at Kwasowski's lace and paper cutting designs. 
In terms of lace making, Kwasowski worked as the creative director and the teacher of composition at the School of Lace Making in Zakopane from 1913 um, until right until the 1930s. His designs won a gold medal at the International Exposition of Modern Industrial and Decorative Arts in Paris in 1925. In his own words, the purpose of his appointment at the um, uh, School of Lace Making was to, quote, transform the character of the school from the Austro-German tradition to a distinctively Polish spirit by getting rid of the excessive Art Nouveau influence and instead basing lace designs on native motifs, unquote. Uh, the the uh, spider motif visible um, in the left hand corner was a recurrent um, uh, symbol which featured in, um, in, in, in Kosowski's output. Um, it can be um, read as a metaphor for, um, for handiwork, as a, as a celebration of the process of making. Uh, however, it was the, the apparently humble paper cutting that can be uh, viewed as the single most significant art form within Kwasowski's diverse output due to the ideological implications of the medium. Uh, um, the, the, the paper cutting flourished uh, in the 19th century. Uh, as I mentioned, it was used by peasants. Uh, to decorate um, the interior of their houses. Um, it was originally made with shears, uh, the, the scissors used to, uh, to cut, um, to, to, uh, to cut um, the fur of sheep. Um, and it was made um, from colored paper by folding colored paper alongside multiple axes of symmetry. Uh, from one axis of symmetry up to 16 um, axes of symmetry. So that, that gives you an idea. Kosowski um, began to learn the art of the paper cutting at the age of eight, uh, to begin with working from newspapers. Um, and very soon he became so successful that as a boy, he was commissioned to, um, to decorate um, his neighbor's houses for peasant weddings. Um, Kon Kon Kosowski continued to perfect the, the craft uh, to seek solace following uh, a teenage disappointment in love. Um, initially, he left the medium of the paper cutting behind when he moved away from his village to pursue a decade long artistic education. But with all the benefit of exposure to the world of high art in Vienna and Krakow, Kosowski chose to revive this modest art form 12 years later after settling down in Zakopane. His initial motivation was to um, gratify his wife by beautifying his marital home at Silent Villa, but it soon became his manifesto of cultural demo democracy. He never lost the joy of making, which helped sustain him through the loss of his wife in 1915 and when both his children were conscripted into forced labor during World War II. And he is known to have created over 350 um, 50 designs. Um, for me, um, they are characterized by uh, great innovation, uh, abstraction, uh, while still retaining the character of all the um, represented creatures, the squirrels, the grasshoppers, the crawling hairy caterpillars, which, which by the way, um, have been used um, as typographical ornaments for our book and a very special, um, very special end papers designed by Dr. Mitchkowska Szterska. I think it's the first book, uh, the first book um, with, with the motif of crawling caterpillars all over the end papers. 
Um, and, um, and I think that um, he was also extremely modern in terms of his use of color, juxtaposing very bright with subdued colors. Um, thank you very much. We have three more uh, images to go. Um, now focusing on uh, less known uh, branches of uh, art and craft. In this case, it's about book binding. Um, it's important that the part of the art and craft ethos, uh, also the, the book printing uh, was extremely important and William Morris placed a special emphasis on the, on the reform of the, of the printing. So there was this movement called the Book Beautiful, also known in uh, in Poland around 1900. And here you have the probably the best uh, uh, book designer uh, active in uh, young Poland period, whose name was Bonaventura Lenart. Um, he was part of the Kraków workshop, which Reshin uh, talked about. Um, in his case, um, he revived the traditional techniques of uh, handicraft uh, regarding both the book binding and also the book design. Uh, in this case, uh, we are showing you here two book covers made of leather and uh, they were all uh, printed uh, by hand in the studio of Krakow Workshop and a place called Museum of Industry and Technology in Krakow, which was one of the institutions founded in the um, second half of 19th century that supported the arts and crafts uh, movement um, in its Polish uh, version. Um, what you see here is his uh, reconstruction of the traditional ornamentation, mostly from Polish 16th century uh, books, 16th and 17th century books, which were highly regarded as the um, pinnacle of Polish uh, tradition of, of printing of that period. Um, one might uh, remind us that uh, Poland, especially Kraków, was one of the centers of European printing in late 15th uh, and early 16th century. So there was a plenty of, uh, of tradition to refer to. Uh, but thinking about Leonard, uh, let me come back uh, once again to the issue of personal lives, because they are absolutely uh, amazing regarding what these people achieved uh, and how their faith was shaped by history. Uh, Bonaventura Leonard is uh, one of the very few uh, Polish artists who actually made it to, uh, to Britain around 1900. And uh, he was educated uh, uh, for a short time in the Camberwell College of Art in London, where the art and craft was pretty much taught uh, uh, to um, both British students, but also international. So he had the first hand knowledge of uh, the British reform. And he came back with that knowledge to Krakow. He also studied in Vienna for a short period. Um, yet he made Krakow the center of his, of his work. In the First World War, he became um, a Polish volunteer in the Polish uh, National Army. There was an uh, army created under Austrian auspices called Legioni, the Polish Legion. And he voluntarily conscripted into them. So he actually fought with arms on the on the front of the Great War uh, to win independence for Poland. In the, in the independent Poland between the wars, he became one of the most eminent uh, uh, book designers. He was responsible for uh, governmental commissions. Uh, he worked for National Library in Warsaw. So he became a sort of a superstar of, of Polish book printing, you know, coming from quite humble origins. Uh, uh, he became a, a pillar of, of this part of the um, art revival independent Poland. He survived the Second World War and he was still active after the after Second World War in the communist Poland with lesser uh, importance uh, than before the war. Still, he, he took all the knowledge from uh, the Krakow workshop beyond Poland period as, as long as second half of the 20th century. And he was also influential in uh, developing the Polish book design after Second World War. So in his life, there's a, a, an unexpected continuity of young Poland until relatively recent period. He died in 1970s. He lived almost to be 100. Um, so he, he shows a certain also personal impact of young Poland on Polish culture in 20th century. 
Thank you. Right, so the, the final object that I chose um, is this watercolor uh, painting uh, by Maria Pavlikovska Jasnozhevska. And um, it, you, what you see on the screen here is, is not two different things, it's just a blur um, of, the, of the drawing that you see on the right, uh, on the left. Um, and I think that this is one of the most interesting pieces, um, actually, that's going to be in the exhibition. So Maria PJ, I hope you don't mind me calling her that, it just saves a little bit of time. Uh, Maria PJ was uh, someone I had not heard about before. Um, I think she's probably one of the lesser known figures of the um, Lodopolska movement. And there is a chapter um, about her in the book that I would very much recommend, it's certainly not written by me, but it's it's a really, really great, great read. Um, and um, I, I think it's so interesting, this drawing, because it really has this idea of art and nature um, and also the kind of human element. We haven't really seen any objects um, so far this evening that kind of bring in psychology, bring in, you know, what people living through this incredibly turbulent and interesting period of history we're going through on a sort of a psychic or on a social level really you know it's it's of course always referred to it's always sort of in the context but you know we don't actually see a lot of human figures in the arts and crafts that we've been looking at so I wanted to introduce this um, for, for that reason. So Maria PJ was extraordinary. She was a poet and a playwright and an artist. Um, she grew up in a cosmopolitan artistic family uh, in, in Poland. Uh, she was born in 1891. So this painting was done in 1916, so she was 25. Um, but, you know, she was educated, she was allowed to, you know, to draw and, you know, encouraged to, to, you know, explore her creativity. But of course, the gender inequalities of the time um, were, you know, were still very much against her. Um, and so, you know, in order to able be able to attend classes, um, you know, she, she had to dress as a boy, you know, steal her brother's passport, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, she, she did not have full equality to the, you know, to the world of art and design that her male counterparts would have had. Um, she married three times and this painting uh, is actually a portrait of uh, her first husband. Uh, the marriage did not go terribly well as you might understand from this drawing. Um, but what it, it, what I think is amazing about it is when you look, when, well, when I first looked, uh, you know, you, it looks like a man in the face of nature, you know, perhaps is that a mountain, you know, he's kind of sort of looking up in shock and awe. And I certainly thought it was a natural form that he was looking up at, you know, something like a waterfall or a mountain. But on closer inspection, of course, you realize it's the end of a woman's dress and there's her shoe uh, poking out. Um, and so, you know, this, you know, very eloquent um, and bold statement on sort of, you know, gender identity, gender disparity is something that I thought was, was interesting. Uh, and from the point of view of someone who is always looking at William Morris, I'm also really interested by the inside of this woman's gown. It has this, you know, medieval style, you know, um, animals. It looks kind of chivalric, heraldic maybe. Uh, and it's just a very interesting um, detail of material culture in a painting that is, you know, not really about material culture, you wouldn't have thought. It reminds me very much, we have um, a, a picture in the gallery actually by William Morris. It's a portrait of his wife, Jane, and she's wearing medieval dress and the inside of her sleeve has this, again, this kind of medieval heraldic pattern in it. Uh, and that, you know, that similarity really, really struck me. Um, so the idea of the significance of material culture and craft and history within the arts um, is obviously an extremely important aspect of the Young Poland movement. Um, and as, as Andre alluded to earlier, um, it's not surprising that Maria knew of the importance of this because she was one of the inhabitants uh, of the fantastic house that Andre showed earlier. Her, her second father-in-law, I believe, was the commissioner of that house and she lived there periodically on and off. So she was quite literally surrounded by the material culture of young Poland. Uh, and I think you know, that might be why um, there is such a focus on the decorative details and the significance of material culture you know, throughout her later work. 
Her life was extremely interesting. Uh, after living in Poland, she moved to France for a little bit. She came back to Poland um, and she wrote a play um, that was a satire of Hitler and the Nazis that was, um, I presume, not deliberately, but with quite bad timing, um, uh, re released on the day that the uh, the Germans invaded Poland. And so that was not a great move um, politically for her. So she came to England with her husband, her third husband, who was a Polish pilot, and they lived in England, um, and he actually fought in the Battle of Britain. Um, and um, she very sadly died uh, quite young in 1945 um, of cancer. So she died in Manchester, so she's buried in England. So this, I think, is a, another really nice connection between the British arts and crafts uh, and the Polish and Lodopolska movement, uh, and shows, you know, in many different ways, um, the, the sympathies and the connections between the two. Thank you. Sorry, um, th this, this is the last set of objects um, to be discussed today. They are particularly pertinent because of the time of the year with Christmas uh, fast approaching. Uh, it is a set of um, Christmas decorations based on the designs of Zdzisław Gedliczka, who was a member uh, of the Kraków workshops uh, and an outstanding um, Polish um, designer. Um, <clears throat> uh, I should add that um, I have uh, discussed the, the topic of Christmas tree decorations with uh, the academic advisor of our book, Linda Parry. Um, and, and Linda Parry has very kindly confirmed that um, there is no record of either William Morris, Morris and Co, or any other British arts and crafts um, designers having um, developed a preoccupation with, with Christmas tree decorations. Um, the, the Christmas tree was um, um, adopted in Britain from the 1840s. Um, it was popularized by um, by Prince Albert, who was of German uh, German heritage, um, and the Christmas tree soon um, became um, widely adopted uh, by British homes. Uh, in um, in the Polish lands, the Christmas tree was um, was adopted at the end of the 18th century. Um, in fact, at the beginning of the first partition um, of Poland, it was adopted um, from, uh, from Prussia. And um, therefore, uh, this incredible set, um, this incredible collection of Christmas tree decorations um, is the only uh, well is 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 um, is one of the uh, um, very few known examples of arts and crafts um, Christmas tree decorations um, from from the Polish lands, and um, is even more extraordinary given that um, that there are no surviving examples in Britain. Um, we have a, a chapter in the book about um, Kraków workshops, toys and um, Christmas tree decorations. I would um, cordially uh, refer you to this um, fascinating chapter uh, by Anna myczkowska szczerska And um, on the left, um, I'm showing uh, several um, original specimens um, recently rediscovered at the National Museum in Krakow after almost a hundred years um, of, 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 of oblivion. And on the right hand side, uh, a set of uh, reconstructions, uh, recreations um, of the complete set uh, based on a combination of archival research 
um, working with um, a set of surviving templates, un annotated um, flat cardboard templates pre preserved by the um, artist son, uh, Professor Adam Gadliczka, and also on the basis of the handful of the surviving examples. Uh, they are characterized by um, visual and constructive coherence, uh, contemporary appearance. Um, they are almost like an open-ended system um, which, which uh, is prone to developing new pieces. Uh, the, the set contains heads of an ox, horse, Saint Nicholas, um, and, uh, and the devil, uh, as well as an insect, a, a crayfish, a piece of fruit, and uh, a rocking horse. Uh, mm, they are, they effectively um, represent the chief characters associated with the celebration of Christmas, um, um, including stable animals, uh, Saint Nicholas celebrated during the Advent, fish as a symbol of Christianity, but also as a traditional uh, Christmas Eve dish uh, in Catholic countries, um, and also um, the devil, which um, appeared in nativity plays and um, carol singing groups. There was also most likely an angel as well. Uh, they are all made up um, using flat cardboard templates by means of strategic cuts, uh, scoring and bending, um, and hardly any, any glue. They also use um, haricot beans for the character's eyes um, and um, uh, also um, materials such as uh, such as wire um, and and pigment and um, they were um, a, a national uh, mode of artistic expression uh, when Poland was striving to um, to preserve an endangered cultural identity and I have to say that my favorite um, element um, in the pieces are the nostrils of of Santa of of Saint Nicholas and the nostrils of the horse and the ox. Thank you very much. I would I would now like to to also take the opportunity um, to extend cordial thanks. Uh, to colleagues from the William Morris Gallery for all their help, professionalism, cosmopolitan outlook, innovative and trend-setting vision, bringing this project to life. Uh, many thanks to Rowan Bain, Roisin Inglesby, James Gray, Mary Mancaster, and Louise Fitton. During the last 20 years working in the heritage sector in the UK, I have never encountered a more dedicated and expert team of museum professionals with a real commitment to international partnerships, cultural democracy, and public engagement, the latter also through exceptionally successful social media platforms Thank you, guys, is not enough. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to purchase this beautiful book, um, if you just go to the Willie Morris Gallery website shop, uh, select your book, and especially for guests, uh, everyone who's here tonight, um, if you type in free gift when you're purchasing your item, 
uh, you'll get a free Christmas decoration from the William Morris Gallery. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone who's uh, been here tonight. Thank you to Julie, uh, Professor Andrzej Szczerski, Julia Griffin, and Rasheen Inglesby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting this. this Thanks very much. Bardzo um, Państwu dziękuję. So I would, uh, I'd like to uh, throw a few questions to our panel. And uh, I've been looking at the chat and a few questions came in during, uh, during the, during the uh, event. Um, Bogusław Pasimowski, to what extent Stanisław Wyspiański followed the style of Czech artist Alfons Muha? So um, if you know, what, one of the panel could uh, answer this one. Well, let, let me answer it because the, the question is pretty straightforward. They, um, they work in parallel, so uh, there's no way of uh, repeating one another. Um, uh, and in fact, Mucha developed his style in a much more decorative way, whereas Wyspiański is uh, stylistically different. He's much more expressive. Also, the, the message that Wyspiański conveys in his art is much more complex and it refers uh, strongly to the Polish context, whereas uh, Mocha um, is very much Art Nouveau international style, especially when he is in Paris. He obviously then moves to his Slavic uh, context uh, in the second part of his life. But in fact, uh, we can see in both these cases, it's a, it's a very striking uh, parallel. And I'm, I'm uh, grateful for this question because it precisely shows you how much this international language of Art Nouveau could have been interpreted in a very different way um, by artists uh, working in a, uh, in a different national milieus. So therefore, uh, therefore uh, Mucha uh, and Wyspiański could be seen in parallel. In fact, you can also argue that if Wyspiański, um, I mean, Mucha worked in printing mostly. He designed uh, very famous posters and he became instantly uh, known and appreciated around the world. Wyspiański worked in a, a different technique, in pastel technique, and he produced unique pieces, so he couldn't be distributed that much. But in fact, they both have the same strength, the same importance and uh, visual impact. Um, and I guess if Wyspiański is now being more and more internationally advanced, he would probably gain a similar uh, recognition than Mucha. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I have a question. Um, to what degree does someone like Maria know about uh, the Morris portrait of his wife? Um, and if she didn't, how does one explain that type of similarity? And I wonder if Rasheen could answer this. Um, I mean, I can't say for certain, but I would be incredibly surprised if, if Maria had had known of that portrait. I mean, it, I just wouldn't have thought that that was possible um, at that time. So. It's a really interesting question. And I think that it's, well, for Morris, I think it's to do with the idea that material culture, so the fabric of our world, you know, quite literally in this case, um, but you know, the, the, the elements that we use to, to surround ourselves are absolutely fundamental to understanding you know, who we are. Uh, and this portrait, of Jane, I think it's, it's a shame, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture to show you, but I think it's less a portrait of Jane, actually. I think it's a depiction of a woman in medieval dress. So it's almost like a portrait of a dress with a woman who happens to be inside it, I think, <laughs> actually. Uh, and Morris, you know, would have been the first to admit that he wasn't great at drawing people, you know, that wasn't his forte at all. Um, so yeah, I think it's a portrait of a dress with a woman inside it. Um, for the Maria, uh, the Maria picture, again, you know, although the, this is supposed to be, um, and I understand only from what I've read, that this is supposed to be a representation of her husband. Again, it's it's more symbolic than, you know, portraiture. Um, and so I'm uh, presuming that, you know, the, the fabric in the dress is metaphor, it is rich with symbolism, you know, it carries this meaning. And so again, you know, what is the most significant aspect in this picture? You know, you look at it and you see this, the naked man and you assume automatically because it's a portrait 
that's the most important thing but actually maybe it's not you know maybe again this is a portrait of a woman in a dress you know with a with a man by her side and so I think that the the symbolism of the medieval the her heraldic here um, carries so much weight and that you know when we're looking at these pictures we always see the people first because that's how we're taught to look at art you know that the subject always has primacy but actually the the idea of material culture and the significance of decorative arts as opposed to you know the kind of more traditional fine art that, that focuses on painting, on sculpture, etc., is that things should have equivalent status, um, and you know we should also look at look at the things as well as looking at the people. Right, and I think Yulish Bogatsky uh, wanted to add that Maria Pavlikovska Jasnozhevska and Stefan Skarzynski, um, he was actually the famous mayor of Warsaw in 1939. I uh, just wanted to add that, that <laughs> little uh, snippet to it. Thank you. <laughs> so Katar Baida has just um, put into the chat. We all know that photography was a Polish invention. The photos were amazing. How much was this new mu medium utilised in popularising this movement? Um, so maybe throw that to Julia, would you? Would you like to answer that one? Uh, well, um, actually, uh, we don't have a chapter on on pictorial photography uh, in our book. Perhaps uh, if we're lucky enough to do further editions, we could perhaps uh, expand its scope. Um, but we do, uh, the book does reproduce a number of uh, wonderful uh, documentary photographs of um, young Poland interiors, including wonderful documentary photographs of the um, Franciscan Church by Juliusz Mien. Um, we also, well, I, I think I have a, a partial answer and, and um, the um, magazine uh, of the um, Polish Applied Art Society uh, called Sztuka Stosowana, um, the Applied Arts magazine, um, reproduced um, photographs of, of key uh, young Poland interiors and, and furniture. And that would have certainly played a part amongst um, amongst uh, the artistic circles. Um, I hope that answers mm. the question. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and um, Monika, to uh, how did the Krakow workshop survive World War One and the Polish Bolshevik War? And I wonder if Professor Szczerski could answer that for us. So, uh, before I answer, Julia, could you show the book, the actual book, to our viewers and our participants? Because I don't think we have shown the book as, as, a, as an object. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, shall, yeah. I, shall I show it as, as, yeah. as, as, yeah. as you're speaking, uh, yeah. Professor Szczerski? So, <laughs> certainly. Let me, let me flick, flick through as uh, Professor Szczerski is speaking. <laughs> Um, so the Krakow workshop uh, survived the war uh, in in um, in the very city of Krakow, uh, thanks to the fact that Krakow was not an occupied city, and they could function in a very limited way. They were in fact uh, they were in fact inscribed into the Austrian scheme of helping the war veterans, and in fact the war veterans were taught by the artists, uh, especially in simple handicraft work. It was also seen as a way of healing wounds of the war, psychological and to some extent physical too, and also a source of income for them. And after the war, uh, um, whole Poland was basically suspended. And because the Poles won the Polish Bolshevik War, so the Kraków workshop could, could be revived uh, right after the war finished. In fact, the, the workshops uh, were officially ended. Uh, as, a, as an institution in 1926, and they gave it over to a new association of artists and designers uh, in Warsaw called WAD um, uh, Harmony, uh, and they became the official, uh, the official followers. 
So, in other words, in a suspended or limited, uh, in on a limited uh, with limited activity, they survive these these events. And this might be a paradox, but from the Polish perspective, the Great War, the First World War, and the Bolshevik Big War were actually victorious wars. They were wars that brought back Poland on the map. They gave us freedom. So for all those associations, uh, the matter of survival was also a matter of uh, regaining the strength right after the independence uh, uh, was won. And in fact, having this insight, uh, because the, the talk about Polish independence during the war was begun in 1916, really. So they knew what they are struggling for. And this also kept them going in the difficult years. Wonderful, thank you. And um, Jesha Kolankiewicz is asking, was there any influence on the music of the time, for example, Karlovic? And I was wondering if Yulia could answer that one. Uh, any musical influences during the, the Young Poland period? Is that the question? Yes, please, thank you. Uh, so certainly uh, the music of, of Frederick Chopin um, became um, a popular subject matter for young Poland painters. Uh, there are some marvelous, um, marvelous paintings uh, which, which represent either Chopin himself, Chopin performing his music, or indeed um, uh, the motif of others performing Chopin's music. Uh, for example, paintings by Edward Okun, who is one of the um, one of the painters mentioned in the in the chapter on paintings by Piotr Kopczak, a fascinating chapter. Uh, and um, Chopin also um, Chopin was also an inspiration for for other branches of arts and crafts. For example, as uh, Dr. Bojana Kostuch uh, demonstrates in her chapter on ceramics, uh, the art uh, the avant garde. Um, um, factory uh, or workshop of ceramics, Nijwiecki, uh, produced medals, um, produced, uh, I beg your pa pardon, ceramic roundels with the likenesses of the most eminent Poles, including one of Chopin. Um, when it comes to young Poland um, composers, um, Karol, Karol Szymanowski is the best example. Wonderful. Thank you. And Frank Sharp is asking, since Władysław Sadowski is heavily influenced by Morris, uh, including designs the Lwów train station, is it known if there's any direct contact between Władysław Sadowski and Morris? And I'd like to uh, put that towards Professor Sterski. Uh, no, there isn't. Uh, we know that uh, uh, there are virtually no signs of direct contact between uh, Polish artists and William Morris, uh, especially those working in, in Polish territories. Um, possibly those who went, especially Polish socialists, uh, could have been in touch with William Morris, at least uh, his close circle. Uh, still, the knowledge about Morris was so widespread in Poland um, around 1900s that it was not necessarily to know Morris personally, but to know of Morris and know his work, to be uh, influenced by it or inspired by it. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this particular uh, artist uh, was well aware of what Morris was doing without actually getting in touch with him. Um, one of the most important channels of, trans of, of communication was the magazine called The Studio, uh, which was published in London by Charles Holm was lavishly illustrated, also with William Morris work. And it was very popular among Poles uh, in, uh, in Krakow and in Lvov, uh, Lviv. So um, this is probably the way that they learned about, about him. Uh, in fact, the, the railway station in Lviv is, uh, is largely an Art Nouveau building with some references to this arts and crafts details. So possibly this is where, where the actual Mauritian touch is to be seen. All right, thank you very much. Uh, if I may, uh, I would like to, um, to, to pass my warm regards to Frank Sharp, 
who is a foremost Morris scholar. He has been um, uh, my source of inspiration in terms of his uh, diligence and empirical approach to research. And he's my fellow contributor to the Rutledge Companion to William Morris. Frank, thanks so much for joining us. It's a moment, moment like this that uh, I'm so thrilled we have a chance to share the vision of these extraordinary artists with our American and British friends. Thank you, Yulia. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Frank. Great. Um, so I have, uh, actually, for Yulia again, um, back to the music. Um, so uh, Christine is asking, uh, what influence did Young Poland movement have on the music of the time? So rather than uh, what music influenced the Young Poland movement, Young Poland movement, how did it affect the music of the time? I am afraid I'm totally out of my depth <laughs> in this regard, <laughs> and I wonder if my um, if my co-editor uh, uh, or or any of our co-authors can can shed some more light on this question. Well, I, I could add to what has already been mentioned by you, Julia. Please don't be <laughs> too too humble about yourself. Um, uh, First, people like uh, Karol Szymanowski uh, were highly influenced by young Poland's discovery of Podhale and Podhale musical tradition. And this entered very quickly into the uh, Polish high art, uh, um, especially, especially the, the classical music. And what uh, probably uh, worth mentioning is this is a long lasting influence because uh, the generation after generation refers to Podhale uh, Gorale music, uh, to mention people like Wojciech Kila, we played his music in the beginning of the uh, of our our event, or someone uh, called Henryk Mikołaj Gorecki, rather well known in British Isles as Gorecki or Gorecki possibly, Henryk Mikołaj Gorecki, who who is uh, largely influenced by uh, Podhale music, and uh, he composed this fascinating symphony that was BBC number one for several weeks uh, about 10 years ago, something like that, uh, uh, um, which uh, you, you might find in, in also in, in British in the British uh, uh, music uh, uh, treasures. So in other words, um, if in the young Poland period, uh, this uh, is mounting this influence, it's beginning to, uh, to be felt, it shapes the, crucially the next generation begins to be active in the 1920s and, uh, and uh, onwards. Uh, to give you one precise example, uh, Karol Szymanowski, who is possibly the greatest Polish 20th century composer, he lived in a house built in Zakopane style in Zakopane. Uh, it's actually part of the National Museum in Kraków now, this house. So whenever you come to Zakopane, you can, you can visit this house and see the interior. So how much he actually uh, combined directly the Gural architecture and ornamentation with his music. Right, thank you very much. Um, I have a, another question. And uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, uh, the chat is at the bottom in the middle, there's a little button and you can type in your question for our panel. Um, the next question is from Stefan and it's what was so special about Zakopane and Gurale? Uh, did other regions have any impact on its development? Um, so, can I throw that to Yulia, please? Um, so, what was so special about uh, the Highlanders, the Zakopane Highlanders and, uh, and the Podhale region? Yes. And did other regions have any influence on Podhale? On a Młoda Polska movement. Uh, oh, okay. Um, thank you. So, um, so I think Professor Szczerski has partially um, uh, touched on this topic in his presentation on, um, on the architectural model of the house under the firs. Uh, and also we have partially touched on this topic um, in, uh, in the film. Um, it, was, it was a very wild part part of Poland because of the mountains. So it was, it was very hard for the um, partitioning uh, powers 
to sort of police uh, that that area. Um, Witkiewicz believed that the area um, was the um, repository of, of, of Polishness and that uh, in fact in the old days uh, that that the um, material culture and an architecture of that region had been uh, more widely spread across all of the Polish lands. Um, well, the uh, the Highlanders had very strong craft traditions, particularly wooden carving, um, embroidery, and also uh, vernacular um, vernacular building methods with very distinctive ornamentation. Um, and also, um, uh, I mean, again, in in the chapter on um, on painting uh, by by um, Dr. Piotr Kopczak. Uh, we have included um, a picture by Jan Rembowski uh, called Marching Highlanders, which you have used, you have very kindly used, Yola, um, for the publicity of our event. I'm, I'm trying to find it. Here it is. Here is the picture. Uh, it's part of, of a larger um, series of paintings intended for the Dwuski Sanatorium. Uh, for respiratory diseases, and um, the the Highlanders became to symbolize bravery. They they came to symbolize a, a strength of character. Um, in terms of other regions, uh, it would I, I can only think about the Hutsul, the Hutsul region. Um, which, which was also um, influential. Uh, I don't know if, if Professor Szczerski uh, would like to add anything. Well, if I may, I really uh, just add uh, the remark that uh, the Zakopane and the Gurale folk culture was extremely rich. It was far richer and far less, uh, far more accessible, uh, less uh, dispersed as in the other parts of, of Poland, which is also has a very, very rich, uh, very rich cultural tradition. Uh, folk folkloristic one, but also the Podhale has been uh, already discovered and elaborated by scholars since 1918, 1980s. So there was a, a plenty of material available already for artists to be studied. Uh, this also can explain why it was Podhale. But that's true that second so rich region was the Hutu uh, region, which is south of the Wolf uh, in, in Eastern Carpathian. In, in Polish, it's called Hutulszczyzna. Um, but uh, uh, this didn't develop uh, so uh, rapidly um, because of, um, well, less interest. Uh, secondly, there was also a national issue and, and religious issue because a, a lot of uh, Hutsuls themselves identified with the Ruthenian tradition rather than Polish. So there was also a kind of a competing vision who, who, whom they belonged to. And for many Ukrainian national movement uh, representatives, they were representing the national uh, Ukrainian tradition. Uh, but uh, yes, there was a hope that on, on Hutsul region, we can also build up a, a regional style, but it didn't develop because of the internal tension so, so effectively. Uh, just to mention uh, one more thing, Witkiewicz believed that Zakopane style was characteristic of all the former lands of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And he even found traces of Zakopane style in Lithuania, uh, in, the, in the folk art of Lithuania. He showed some parallels between them, uh, between the especially ornamental motifs in northern Lithuania and southern Poland. So there's also a sense that this being kind of transnational style, and that also adds to the, to the quality and the impact of this ornamentation on the thinking uh, of, of uh, young Poland movement. Thank you so much. Um, and I have a really important question that so many people are asking. And, uh, and this is for Rasheen. Um, when is the Polish version coming out? <laughs> <laughs> that is a fantastic question. Um, and there is, I have to say, there is currently not yet a plan for the Polish version. However, 
Um, I'm very much hoping that that plan might be uh, that might come into existence in the not too distant future. Um, many of our contributors to the book uh, are Polish speakers, so they wrote in Polish in the first place. So you know, it wouldn't be too half of half of it is already translated, is what I'm trying to say. So I hope that that will give the impetus uh, for a Polish version at some stage. But because the exhibition is taking place in England and because this is such a, a little known movement in in the English speaking world. Uh, that's why the book has been published in English in the first instance. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to the exhibition in October. Yes, it'll be October uh, next year, to October to January next year. Wonderful. So Professor Szczerski has to um, say goodbye to some uh, particularly beautiful items, I presume? I regret, but I promise <laughs> we will look after them. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll be, I'll be pleased to, to let them let them tour the Europe and uh, <laughs> let them arrive in London. No, no, it's, oh, it's not a farewell, but it's uh, it's invitation for you to see them in flesh in London. Yeah, very, very exciting, and you know we're we're really, really looking forward to that. And uh, and the book, from everything I've seen so far, it's freshly printed, um, and it's it's quite a beautiful publication, with fine quality reproduction, lovely, well done, really. Um, so. Um, I think uh, we've covered all our questions um, and I would like to thank the three of you. I would like to thank um, Professor Szczerski. I'd like to thank Pleasure. Yulia. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. And uh, Rasheen, thank you so much. It was just a wonderful, wonderful evening. You know, you gave us so much insight into this really important movement. And it, it's just wonderful to be able to share this with um, with, you know, with an English audience um, and a Polish audience living in England. So thank you so much. Um, so we will now come to our favorite part of the evening, which is um, to thank uh, my Zoom committee members. And that's Anja Mochlinska, who did artwork and a lot of organizing with me. Tomasz Mahura, who has really held everything together tonight, thank you. And uh, Julek Bogatsky, who uh, has kept our, our, our chins up and uh, looking forward and keeping us happy when we thought things wouldn't happen. So thank you so much. Um, Ognisko Polskia would like to do a little announcement. Uh, we have a Christmas party with English and Polish carols led by the wonderful Wokalinki. So please put this into your Zoom diaries for the 6th of December at 7 p.m. And this is the truly exciting moment when uh, I would like to invite all of you to our breakout rooms. Uh, regulars are familiar with this and any new guests, this is an opportunity to meet your fellow guests, but also our wonderful panel will be dropping in. So we're not saying goodbye just yet. They will be dropping into the breakout room so you can ask any questions personally and um, do pop over to the William Morris Gallery shop and uh, do place your order because as a guest of tonight's launch, is a, this is the worldwide launch of the book, uh, there is a beautiful free gift from the gallery to all of our guests. So thank you so much. And Tomasz is going to start dropping everyone into breakout rooms. Thank you very much. Thank you.